You ready to go ahead and start? It looks like everybody that was waiting is in. Yes, ma'am. All right, great. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm Susan Walters. I'm uh, with the Restaurant and Lodging Association and we're so excited to have you with us today. We've got some uh, great speakers and at the end, uh, John Durst will give us a legislative uh, update and you won't wanna miss that. There's lots of things going on at the State House, uh, even as today as we speak. So um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if everybody, if you're not already muted, if you'd mute your lines because we are recording this meeting. And if you will submit any questions that you have during the uh, webinar, uh, in the Q&A feature, we'll save the chat box for links and other information that we wanna share. So if you have any questions uh, at any time, we'll go ahead and put those in the Q&A. Um, also wanted to let you know that this meeting is off the record. So if there's any members of the media that would like to uh, talk on the record, please reach out to our office. Lindsay Jolly is our director of communications. Should be glad to assist you with that. All right, so let's get started. First up, we have Clinton Wolf. Uh, he's the Senior Vice President of Health and Insurance Services at the National Restaurant Association. And he will discuss how small operators can get affordable health care uh, coverage through the Restaurant and Hospitality Trust. All right, Clinton, you're up. Great, hey, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm here with Jean Stevens today and uh, she's gonna be helping me out uh, you know, also with, with the slide piece of this too. Um, got a few slides to walk through this. So, uh, you know, one of the things at the association that we've been focused on for a long time is trying to find affordable healthcare options for operators. It is one of those things that continually comes up in our uh, surveys of kind of the, the big issues for operators. Um, and obviously with COVID this year and, you know, the importance of being able to have good health, access to healthcare uh, makes it even more important. Um, so in looking at, you know, in South Carolina, there's a couple of things as, you know, smaller restaurants that need to know about. And one of them is really how their what their size is. Um, and that's because it determines on how your group gets priced in the employer market. So, you know, in South Carolina, they kind of make that split between, you know, how many insurance eligible employees you, you have. And so, you know, in that case, you know, anybody who's on salary is going to be eligible for insurance. And then depending upon your size, it's going to be anywhere from, you know, for the hourly employees, anybody who's consistently working 30 to 40 hours a week. Um, now, if you're under that, um, you're in what's called the adjusted community rating market. And that's got some, you know, there are pros and cons uh, to the way this one's set up. Uh, it is one of these where there's no underwriting involved in it. So you don't have to worry about it if you have a health condition. Um, and because of that, it's also pretty quick to get your coverage in place. But the challenge for restaurants in this segment is that the way it's set up by law with the pricing of it is that younger people pretty heavily subsidize older people with that. And for restaurants, because we employ so many younger people, they tend to get disadvantaged by that, um, you know, relative to what their actual cost is. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, what most people have to deal with. And we have a, a program that actually is unique to the association that I'll talk about here in a minute. If you're over that 50 though, you get in what's called the 51 plus or large group market. And in that one, they tend to price you by what they expect you to actually cost. Uh, so they, there is health underwriting associated with that. And then they look at the younger people and the older people, and then they average that out across all of them. And so one of the things that you see in that large group market is that if you've got employees, everybody's paying the same price, you know, if you're uh, in, in that tier. So if you're a single employee, all the single employees pay the same rate, whether they're 25 or 65. In that two to 50 market, it's different because each individual actually pay is priced differently. Um, so you get more budget certainty also in that large group market. So you know that if you bring on a new hire in the middle of the year, um, if you're in that small group market, you don't know what uh, they may cost you in terms of benefits. But if you're in that large group market, you know what they're going to cost you um, because everybody in that situation pays the same uh -huh. price. So, um, you know, 
one of the things uh-huh. that we came out with is our association health plan. And that actually really helps, especially the people in that two to 50 segment, because they get all those advantages in that large group market now, um, but yet they still have access to that to, to the small group market if that works out to be a better deal for them. Um, if we could go to the next slide, the association health plan that we put together, it's called the Restaurant and Hospitality Association Benefit Trust. You know, it's not one moment. Oh, it's not advancing. It's not, it's not advancing. Um, hold on one second. Sorry. Let's just try that again. This is the, there well, we, we can go. Also, okay. I got it. We can also certainly distribute the slides to everybody afterwards as well um, with us. Can, um, can you see that? Yeah. Can you see that now? Um, the slide? I do not. Okay. This slide is up right now. I think you're good. It's on the um, okay. South Carolina requirements defined by insurance eligible employees, small group adjusting community rate slide. Yeah, great. Yeah. If we could go to the next slide then um, on that, okay. it talks about our association health plan. Um, so, you know, we've endorsed United Healthcare um, and we work with them on our association plan as well with that. Um, and we were able to put some really nice. Um, industry specific features into the program um, that make it a really great option. One of them is a management carve out. And that is where you're able to actually cover or offer certain coverage to your management team. And this is something that's been very popular um, with restaurants around the country. And that's just because, you know, everybody, um, you know, really wants to focus on that kind of core team that they have there. we're a high turnover industry, but most of that turnover is in the part-timers um, and in that, uh, thank you, Doug, um, the next slide there, Doug. Um, you know, with the management carve out, you can actually identify the people who are in your management team. There's a lot of flexibility around that. And then the, um, you know, you can offer them a specific set of benefits and contributions with that. And then for the people who are non-management, you can do something totally different for them. Um, And if you're a small employer under that 50 uh, with the ACA, you don't even have to do anything um, for them because you have that choice. And so that's really great. Uh, We see a lot of uh, restaurants taking advantage of that because there's a feature in employer insurance called employee participation that restaurants often have trouble meeting with insurance carriers. Uh, One of the reasons we partnered with United is they have a relatively lenient participation requirement and that it is 50% of employees enroll in the insurance, uh, less valid waivers. Uh, Some carriers, it's 75% of everybody. Um, So that 50% is definitely a lot lower. Um, And a valid waiver is important to understand because it's, um, you know, if you're on your spouse's plan, uh, maybe you're a veteran and you're on the, um, the VA program, or very importantly for our industry, if you're under 26 and on your parents' plan. And in those situations, they don't count towards that participation. So if you've got, say, 10 employees who are eligible and four of them have a valid waiver, well, then you have six. And if that's the situation, you only need three people to enroll. So it's a very big, it's a really uh, important piece to make the insurance uh, more accessible uh, for people in the industry. And it's very friendly in that respect. Um, We've got some other great features in the program. I'm going to try and keep us on track here in terms of time, but uh, I would certainly encourage people to find out about this. If you're in that smaller segment, you can get a price for this and a price for the regular market and see which one works out better for you, um, which is certainly encourage people to do. And it's a great way to get access, um, especially, you know, with the connection with the employer employee retention tax credit that's going to be following this. Um, Just real quickly, a couple of things. United Healthcare has a lot of value add features that are built into their insurance. Um, They've got some great programs on diabetes and cancer. But one of the things that's administrative in nature is they have a thing called a Section 125 plan set up in COBRA administration, and they do this for free. Uh, And a lot of other uh, carriers charge for this. So that's another thing that can be a really nice savings for employers because it adds up. Um, you know, you kind of get nickel and dimed with these things. Um, and that helps to, you know, the section one, two, five plan, what that does is it allows 
an employer to save on FICA taxes. The cost of insurance is one of those things where a lot of people get worried about it. Um, they think it's going to cost too much, but it can be a lot more affordable for the employer than you might expect. And I say that in that, you know, it, it depends upon demographics and how low your deductible is and all of that stuff. But for an employer, your contribution is 50% of the lowest cost plan that you offer employees. Okay. And so for, you know, most restaurants can find a plan that is the lowest cost that's in, I'll you know, probably that 300 to $350 a month range per employee. That's the total premium. So you're in for, as the employer, that'd be 150 to $175, but you get tax benefits off of that. So the employer contribution, you get to write that off as a business expense. And then if you set up the section 125 plan on the employee portion, you save on the FICA taxes, both the employer and the employee side of that. So between those two things on an after-tax basis, you know, you're probably talking anywhere from $100 to $135 a month uh, for that uh, cost to that employee, for the, each employee that enrolls, um, which I think is a lot more affordable than a lot of people realize because, um, you know, when you think, when you put that out on an annual basis against having to, you know, give somebody a raise or some other things like that, it's, um, you know, it's not so bad, especially if it's confined to the management group. Um, so uh, with that, just one other program that we have that I think is a great benefit uh, on the healthcare side. This is not health insurance that's on the next slide, but we have a great telehealth program. Um, and sorry, the next slide after that. Um, with the telehealth program, and it's called Healthiest You. Um, and this is not insurance. So, but what it does, because it's not insurance, it's super flexible in who you offer it to. So you can offer it to people who are seasonal, 1099s, people who are working 15 hours a week if you want to, or people working 35 hours a week if you want to. Um, and what it does is it gets them access to certain types of care. And so there's certainly like the general medical um, that is sort of like an urgent care. So you can save somebody the time and hassle of having to go to the, do to the doctor to see if they have strep throat and they can write them a prescription. Now, they got to pay for that prescription on their own, but they can get it. Um, but, you know, dermatology, so a lot of people are getting like rashes on their face from the mask that they're having to wear all the time. You can go on your phone and talk to a dermatologist to see if it's anything or what to do about it. Um, and actually, one of the huge benefits of this one is mental health. Uh, you can schedule time to talk every week if you want with a, with a social worker um, if you've got an issue. And all of those services, there's no copay associated with it. It is, you know, there is no cost to the uh, employee around that. You know, so it's got some really great benefits. Um, and all that, it's just seven bucks a month, um, which is, and it includes the family. So it's a really great benefit. It's very targeted. I mean, you know, there's certainly, you know, if they got to go to the hospital or something like that, it's not insurance. It doesn't cover it but it gets them access to healthcare for a lot of the routine things that they're going to need. And the mental health thing is a massive value for if anybody wants to use that. So we've got some great things um, and you can go to restauranthealthcare.org uh, where we have other education resources. And um, if you want to learn more or you can contact me. Um, and, you know, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Gene Stevens real quick, who has years of experience, you know, in health insurance and working with restaurants. And, you know, she's just a great person. She really simplifies all of this. I tried to keep it pretty high level, but I'm sure I got a little into the weeds too far. Um, she's better at simplifying this than I am and, and a great resource for you as well. Thank you, Clinton. So my family is in that restaurant business. Um, and... I understand what it, you know, the cost around, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge for businesses to combine the right mix of benefits to attract and retain top employees. So I'd love to talk to you about that. I try to keep the word insurance out of the conversation and just, uh, you know, get down to the bottom line and giving you the proposals for the state here, what they have, you know, an open market and the trust and explain one and the other and find out what what point would be good for you to go forward and look at, you know, to look at benefits. Um, 
So I, I handhold you through the whole process and make it simple and I'm, I'm not, I'm easily reached. Um, I'm also, I'm also, and I love that Teladoc, Clinton, you did a great job with that. Sorry about your slides. Um, the Teladoc was like a, with a, a hospital plan. It would be fantastic for, for, for a business owner. And I can help you decide if you want to know who's a manager and who's not. You, they're very loose on their management, like who you want to pick, the kitchen guy, the front lady that greets everyone. They can be managers. We can talk of, over all that. I'm also offering a kind of a, kind of a um, promotion for you all. And um I'm a partner with a company called Think HR. So if anyone decides to quote with me, I think they're going to put up my slide and my bio right now. Um, you and they're going, to, they're going to share that. I will give you 90 days uh, with Think HR, which is a very, very high, wonderful HR um, company at no cost. No cost. Just to quote the trust and, and take a peek. And you can say, can't afford it till next year. Or this looks great. I'm still going to give you that 90 days of with Think HR. It'll give you the opportunity to build an employee handbook, um, job pull job descriptions, go in and look at the employee training videos. Um, it's a wonderful um, um, HR platform. Also, it gives you an unlimited um, hotline to SHRM qualified um, HR specialists and their average um, year in the business is 18 years. They're used by national payroll companies, national insurance companies, and I'm just going to give it to you to, to take a peek at the trust. If you decide you like it, I charge $50 a month and I donate some of that um, back to the trust. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope I hear from some of you. I think um, if you're in any kind of insurance here in the state group benefits, it'd be a good time to review the trust with those, you know, with what you have currently. And um, love to love to speak with any of you if you have an interest. Thank you. I'm done. Great. Thank you, Clinton and Jean. That's awesome. I don't think we have any questions. Linza, are there any questions that we need answered? Not that I see right now. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for that information. We appreciate that. Uh, next right, up, thank you. we have Brad Daniels, and uh, Brad is the Southeast Cares Act Restaurant Operations Consultant for U.S. Foods. Uh, he's going to give us a brief uh, update on the CARES Act, specifically to the new uh, non-payroll expenditures for which the PPP funds can be used. And most of his presentation will focus on the employee retention tax credit that's available to most of the operators in the state uh, because of the government mandates that are in place now. Um, he'll also briefly discuss the restaurant tax that is currently in Congress and what that means for restaurants. All right, Brad. All right. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, my screen should be coming up here in just a second. I uh, just want to thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to, uh, to, to have the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, so today we're talking about the employee retention tax credit and uh, some of the new COVID relief that is in Congress currently, because uh, that's really important to, uh, to understand. Now, with this employee retention tax credit, uh, you may have seen it in the QSR magazines and a few other things. This is really starting to blow up a little bit, and people are starting to understand really what it means for restaurants and what has been out there. Uh, and as we look at this today, we're going to talk about the two things, the pending uh, $25 billion restaurant revitalization fund and the, the employee uh, retention tax credit. Uh, first and foremost, I have to do my, uh, my legal part of it, and this is for informational purposes only. Is not legal, financial, or tax advice. If you have specific legal, financial, or tax questions, you should consult your attorney or tax advisor as appropriate. U.S. Foods is not affiliated with the United States Small Business Administration and does not act as a lender or referral agent for SBA lenders. SBA loan programs are subject to eligibility. Please consult with counselor for the SBA or licensed SBA lender for additional information. And the reason we say that is because uh, in my role, I'm a restaurant operations consultant for U.S. Foods, and I was a chef for 14 years before coming to U.S. Foods and, uh, and uh, have dealt most of my career in, in that role with the profitability of restaurants and have uh, pivoted dramatically to uh, deal with the legislation that's involved with it. Uh, and we are not experts, but we, uh, we read the legislation and try to guide operators to, uh, to funds that are available to them. Uh, recently with the ERTC, that has allowed uh, the team that I'm on and myself to find about $15 million a day for operators that they did not know was available to them. 
But before we get there, we're going to start talk. We're going to talk about the uh, revitalization fund because that is is going to be huge for restaurants uh, when this passes. It's currently in the house, and you'll notice the big red pending sticker up there because this is in the house currently. It's made it through the house committee. It is not law yet, but we want to make people aware of it because there's some huge things that are coming out right at the beginning of it. So, what type of restaurants are eligible? Uh, in short, if they serve food or drink they're gonna be eligible with this Restaurant Revitalization Act. And what this means specifically is in the first 21 days of this $25 billion program, that's part of that 1.9 trillion stimulus package. In the first 21 days, it's open specifically to the small business concerns only controlled by women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged small business. So what that focus is, is to get them to the front of the line and get them the uh, get them the funds that they need or they have not had the access to and allow them to uh, process that before opening up to everyone else. So what we're talking about this is the five million or five billion dollars specified for uh, businesses that had gross receipts of under 500,000. This is tremendous for a lot of the operators that we have in South Carolina, tremendous for those businesses that have been right on the, the uh, cusp of, of making it or not making it. We're trying to get them the funds back. Uh, and it was a huge part of it is it can be used in addition to the PPP loans. Uh, there's no mention of the idle loans and having to pay that back, but also in addition to the, uh, the ERTC, the employee retention tax credits. So as we take a look at this, uh, for uh, simplicity, let's take a look at the math. The way this is going to work with this revitalization fund is if a operator made $2 million in 2019 in gross receipts, and then take track what they made in 2020. So if they only made a million dollars in 2020, that's $1 million that's available to them in grants. Now we take the, the PPP loans away and that will be a result of $711,000 that will be available to the restaurants you can see quickly and easily how this is going to benefit operators and benefit restaurants who have struggled through that 2020 season and still trying to move forward. And that's why we're so excited about it and trying to get that information out before it even comes up. Uh, once again, I point to the, uh, the big red sticker on there that says pending because this is pending in, in Congress right now. Uh, another huge thing is that, that this will help operators that were not in operation in 2019 fully so those that came on at the tail end and did not get a lot of uh, a lot of funds due to the PPP uh, taking into account their 2019 payroll. So this will give them the opportunity to to look into that and get into that. And also for those operators that started after that February 15th date for the PPP, uh, and then this works in conjunction with the ERTC and finding funds for those operators that that kind of fell in that uh, that gap between not having enough payroll to generate enough funds from the PPP and getting them forward. So, and I understand I'm going through this uh, fairly quickly, but uh, this isn't the main topic for, uh, for today. So I just wanted to touch on this and, and show what is coming to, to get everyone excited about paying attention to this process and paying attention to what is coming through Congress. Now, the things that you can use these funds for are very similar to what you can use the PPP for. It's just not going to have the same stipulations as the 60-40 split between payroll and payroll protection or payroll and non-payroll expenses. Uh, now, some of the things that it, they are uh, adding into it is maintenance. So as you expand supplier costs and other things that will be built into it, and they're extending the ERTC with this as well as long as too much of this doesn't get changed in Congress. But we gotta know how that goes. Uh, we'll see what it looks like on the, on the tail end of going through the House and the Senate. So I apologize for going through that uh, quickly, but again, I just wanted to touch on that before we got into the, uh, the main part with the employee retention tax credit. So this is really what uh, I've been hearing a lot more than we have ever heard in the last few days. It's starting to make itself uh, known, but it has been part of the CARES Act from the very beginning. Uh, the, the employee retention tax credit and the PPP were in the original CARES Act, but in the beginning, you could not do both of them. It was an either or, or situation. You could either take the PPP or you could take the ERTC. So in doing so, you made one or the other ineligible. Most operators took the PPP because that gave them, enough, they gave them more funds than the ERTC could. So that's why it's misunderstood from this beginning, because originally you could not do both. With the legislation that passed recently, you, have, you can. Uh, they have made it so you can retroactively go back and take the ERTC for 2020, which was a, a, 
uh, godsend for many operators because they were wondering how they're going to get through these seasons, get through these funds. Now, we'll get into this a little bit more, but with the legislation, they also extended and expanded the, the ERTC for 2021. And this is, this is huge for our operators, again, with the eligibility and the amounts of uh, funds that this is providing for our customers, the customers and operators. So this is probably the biggest part of the ERTC. It's available to businesses open after COVID-19 or February 15th, 2020. So any of you have applied for a PPP loan, you'll know that that date is, is, is a hard date for the cutoff for the PPP, that if you were in business on uh, February 16th, you were denied a PPP loan. This is something that is gonna be able to offer those funds to those businesses and offer those funds to, to ones that have been around since that February 15th date. Now, I have to make a note that the final IRS regulations have not been released. That just means that they have not released the interim final rules. We are going off of what the legislation says and what the legislation for that has passed Congress is saying about the ERTC. The uh, IRS will take it and they will uh, put their lens on it and uh, make their changes to whatever is, is applicable for them. And that will be the final say so. But what we're reporting on here is just the actual legislation and how it reads. So what is the employee tax credit? Simple. Credit on federal taxes, employers pay on wages and salaries. So the credit is coming from your FICA taxes, your withholding. And again, you can do this for 2020 and for 2021. And I'll show you kind of how that all plays together here in a sec. It's a business tax credit, not an income or personal tax credit. So it's only coming off the withholding, uh, the withholding taxes, but it is fully refundable. Uh, it applies against those payroll taxes. And if it, you can't, make enough back on the refund. So if what you have to pay back to the, the IRS does not cover that rebate, then you receive those, those uh, additional funds back from the IRS in the form of a check. Another call out is uh, for quarter one, quarter two of 2021. Uh, if there's a need for the funds, you can also take an advance on those credits for 2021. Uh, so that's based off of your 2019 payroll and finding the advance that goes with that. Again, this is not a grant or a loan. Uh, and the PPP was a loan. If you used everything the way that you uh, intended to, to do it in the way that it was specified, you receive that back as forgiveness. Uh, this is neither one. You, you are not required to follow the guidelines of what you can and cannot use those funds for. It is considered income, so you're going to pay income taxes on it. But once you've paid those income taxes, you can use those funds however you need. So as we go through this, what's the qualifiers? And this seems to be the biggest uh, misunderstanding where, where the call of qualifiers are for both 2020 and 2021. Now, as we're looking for 2020, we're talking about a date from March 13th through December 31st as the qualified dates for, uh, for the ERTC for 2020. Now, last year, it, any operator that was uh, fewer than 100 full-time equivalents uh, could apply for the ES ERTC. If you had over 100 full-time equivalents, you can still apply for this ERTC. The only difference is, is you're only going to get those credits back on, uh, on those wages that you pay for people not to work. So if you were specifically paying them not to work and you were over 100 uh, FTEs, uh, which is full-time equivalent, then that's how, you got your, uh, that's how you got your credits back. So as we look at this, the qualifiers are full or partially suspension of the operation. So full or partial suspension of the business. Now, when we look at this from the lens of a, of, of a restaurant, that full or partial suspension of the business is reduced occupancy, uh, table six feet apart requirement, uh, outside dining or no inside dining, uh, reduced hours. All of those are considered, considered partial suspensions of the operation. Some of them may be specific to the, operate, uh, to the operator as far as uh, whether it is uh, it, it uh, adjusts their, their uh, business or not. But for the most part, if any of those man government mandates that are in place are full or partial suspension of the business. In South Carolina, we were at a, uh, an occupancy restriction to I believe around August, that's been lifted. We still have some of those things in place with the, uh, the hour restrictions, but I know that there's some talks that that may be uh, coming to an end as well. But for 2020, just about any of our operators were fully or partially suspended for the majority of that year. 
Now, if they weren't, there was a second qualifier, and that was a 50% reduction in gross receipts over that time period uh, to qualify, and then a 20% reduction in gross receipts uh, to, to maintain that. And that was a year over year comparison. So, where a lot of this confusion with the ERTC is, is in whether or not it was both or an either or situation. And it's been clarified that it is an either or situation. You only need one of these qualifiers to qualify for the ERTC. Uh, and this also includes tax exempt organizations. So uh, any uh, nonprofits can, can apply for this. They can get those credits back and that opens it up to, uh, to country clubs and other aspects, whether it's a, either a tax exempt or private, uh, private uh, dealership, then they, they have the opportunity to take these tax credits. Uh, now, as we move forward, we'll break down what the difference is in the 2020 and the 2021 uh, eligibility on this. So with the new legislation, they extended, uh, they extended those tax credits out from December 31st of the original to June 30th of uh, 2021. With this new uh, Restaurant Revitalization Act, that is anticipated to extend all the way out to the end of the year. So if that happens, uh, that is going to make a tremendous difference with our operators. They've also extended that uh, 100 full-time equivalent threshold to 500 full-time equivalent threshold. So there, those that were falling in uh, just over that 100 uh, full-time equivalents can now take those credits, those full credits on any employees that are working uh, that on their wages that are paid during that time period. So what are we talking about when we're talking about the, uh, the wages? Uh, well, we're 2021, uh, the, the other qualifier, let me back up just a second, I apologize. Uh, we, we still have that government mandate in place as far as uh, if that is uh, that government mandate for fully or partially suspension of the business in place, or for 2020, they, they, they raised that threshold to a 20% gross receipts uh, reduction. So if an operator is, uh, is at 20% or more uh, less in their gross receipts, then they qualify for this program. And that less 80% is compared to if they are 80% under uh, for their revenues as compared to 2020. It starts to get really muddy and really confusing as far as all the, uh, the different uh, alphabet soup and all the numbers get thrown out of it. And that's why we really dove into this and uh, have been living this on a day-to-day basis and trying to get operators to, to have a conversation with us so we can guide you to what you need to take to your account in this. Now, employers not in existence in 2019 can sub equivalent quarters for 2020. What that means is those operators that don't have a comparison back for 2019 to determine whether or not they are under, uh, they are down on their, uh, on their sales or not, their gross receipts, then they can use an equivalent quarter for 2020 and said to help uh, determine that. So the credit itself, is for 2020 is a 50% credit on wages paid per employee for up to $10,000, meaning that's $5,000 potential per employee from that, uh, from that time period from March 13th through December 31st for 2020. Uh, now you can't double dip, you can't take, a, take uh, a credit on wages that were paid out with the PPP. So you, uh, that's where the accountant is important. We always defer to the accountant and the CPA uh, also, with the extension of this for 2021, that's 70% of those same, same $10,000 in wages paid per employee for both quarter one and quarter two. So that's the potential for $7,000 back for quarter one and $7,000 back for quarter two. If you meet one of those two qualifiers, the business is at full or partial suspension, or you're at a 20% uh, 20 uh, reduction in your gross receipts. Nope, got a little bit ahead of myself on this, but that's $10,000 max. That is not saying that they've only made $10,000. That is just what the, the max that you can take the, uh, the, the credit on. Uh, if they have made less than that, you're still getting that 50% rebate for 2020 and that 70% for 2021. Now, you can see if the max credit for four, is $14,000 for 2021, and it's only in quarter one and quarter two, if this gets extended out to quarter three and quarter four for the uh, Restaurant Revitalization Act, that is going to have a, a, a huge impact on the labor side of restaurants. 
because if you have the ability to get almost 70% of your labor back into the restaurant, that will give you the ability to, to use those revenues to build back up and gain back to those uh, pre-2021 steps. So what's the next steps? First off, don't be in a rush. You've got up to three years to apply for this. As I said, it is complicated. There are a lot of moving parts with this, uh, with this program. There are a lot of moving parts with this tax credit. So take your time and uh, get the information in. The expectation is that you're gonna be able to go back and take uh, use your 941X to uh, amend your 2020 returns and get those credits paid back to you. Uh, we don't know that for sure because the, uh, the IRS has not, uh, has not given their interim final rule. We're still waiting for that. We're trying to find that out. As soon as we know that, it'll be more clarified. For 2021, is much more clear in how you do that. If you are in need of cash ahead of time, you can actually put in a form 7200 and receive those back, uh, receive that as an advance uh, based off your 2019 payroll, or you can, uh, you can just take them off of your 941 as you do your uh, quarterly taxes. Reach out to your accountant and your CPA. Uh, again, I'm not the expert, but I can guide the accountant and the CPA to the information that's in the legislation, and we'd always defer to them and what, what they can do. Uh, reach out to your payroll provider to see how you can set yourself up with these, uh, with, with these discounts, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, credits as they're coming out for quarter one and quarter two moving forward. And then uh, always visit the IRS for their updates. The FAQs are, are uh, routinely updated to let you know what the new information is and, and how they are making judgments on some of these things. And on the last, I want to invite you to schedule some time with me or one of my colleagues so we can do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with you, a one-on-one -on -one consult. Uh, if you follow, you just hold your phone up to the QR reader, that's going to take you to a... Uh, a site so you can choose a time uh, that works best for you. And, and again, each situation is different. Uh, every restaurant is different. Every operation is different. So we help to, to dive into those things and take a look at them and see what is specific to you and see where those funds can come from because there are a lot of government funding that's available to restaurants and uh, many of them are just not aware of it. So with, with that, I see a few questions popping up in the, uh, the corner there. Let me stop sharing my screen. So one of the first questions we had come through um, was about hotels. Would the closing of breakfast or closing of meeting rooms constitute partial suspension of operations for the ERTC? Uh, well, the uh, and, uh, again, I'm always going to defer to the CPA, CPA on this, uh, but with the, the FAQs that are in place, if it is a if it is a suspension of the typical business, so the, if that is part of the normal operations, and you don't have the ability to do that, and it has an impact on the business, then that should qualify for uh, full or partial suspension of the business. Yeah, it looks like that's the only question we had come through in the chat box, but just a reminder, this will be recorded and also posted on our website um, if you need to refer to it after meeting. Great. Thank you so much, Bradley. Uh, great you. presentation. Lots of good information. Uh, someone in the audience even said it was the best review of the credit that she's ever heard. So that was awesome. Kudos to you. Thank you so much. Um, next up will be John Durst, our president and CEO. John? Thank you, Susan. I want uh, first to echo what uh, you just shared with the folks because I was watching the comments coming in via chat and uh, the participants uh, are extremely grateful for uh, what y'all have shared, uh, you panelists have shared with us today. And I want to add to that, uh, Susan, a, a huge thanks to you for uh, putting this together. Uh, there's a lot involved in it. And thank you for the great job that you've done on it. Um, on the agenda, it says that I am to give a legislative update. Well, um, guess what? This is not gonna be a legislative report as much as it's going to be breaking news because a lot has happened today. And with that teaser, before we go into some of those items, I want to give Douglas O'Flaherty an opportunity to uh, tell you all about a grassroots website that uh, we have just made available. So Douglas? Take it away. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, did want to talk a little bit about a website that we just launched. And many of you may have received an email yesterday or noticed it in your social media feeds uh, today. Uh, we have launched a grassroots website called 
uh, uh, savesctips.org. The purpose of savesctips.org is to be able to educate you, the restaurateur, the consumers, and of course our elected officials, how important it is to be able to sustain a tipped wage. Currently, the Raise the Wage Act, um, as introduced by Congress, would eliminate the tip credit, which that means that you would pay your tipped employees the same as you would pay your other employees. The plan currently, as proposed, is to increase the tip, or excuse me, increase the minimum wage from $7.25 and to $15 an hour over the course of the next five years. Now, there is a breakdown. You can find that on the website. I won't waste a lot of time going through there. But the one point that I want to ask you to do and, and really reach out to, to your uh, servers and to your bartenders and to your hosts and to your bussers, that uh, we're looking for folks to share their testimonial. We're looking for restaurant operators, service bartenders, any tipped employees to be able to send us a selfie video of how this affects their income. And, and, and tell us their story. Um, we need to be able to have these videos. We want them to be raw. We want them to be real. They, we want them to be natural uh, there and to be able to tell the story so we can pass these along to our elected officials and share your story. You can do that on savesctips.org. Um, you can just click that button as you see on your screen there and that will link it and you can just email us the video. Do not worry about editing, adding music or doing any of those kinds of things to it. The, the more pure, the more raw, the better the video that we'll have. So John, I'll turn it over back to you for okay. the rest of your report. All right, thank you. Uh, breaking news item number one. Um, Senator Graham is the minority leader of the Senate Budget Committee. And they had a hearing this morning uh, and um, Senator Graham uh, was very concerned that the broad subject matter, hold on the legislative agenda items for a second. Okay? Senator Bob Graham was very concerned that the, um, the broad discussion topics did not include some input from the restaurant perspective. So he insisted that a South Carolina restaurant operator be allowed to share his perspective, uh, the operator's perspective on the Raise the Wage Act. And Carl Sobosinski from Greenville, who is our liaison with the National Restaurant Association uh, and uh, has also served on the board of the NRA, uh, provided a six minute testimony. And uh, I'm gonna share just a couple of excerpts with you. Um, what we have put out, by the way, a news release on Carl's testimony today uh, it's, it's on our website and also has been uh, set up by uh, Lindsay Social Media. Is that what you did, Lindsay? Yes, as Senator um, out via email and also posted on our website. It'll go on social media later today. Thank you. Uh, he said, what is most alarming to me is that the raise, raise the wage act would eliminate a separate tip wage, destroying the very business model that restaurants across the nation rely upon. And he said, the bottom line is, Raise the Wage Act is predicted to result in 1.4 million job losses, with a one in three chance of that number rising to 2.7 million job losses. These aren't just statistics on a piece of paper, these are real people who may lose their jobs with their livelihoods being taken away. Uh, so he provided that testimony today. We'll see uh, how that discussion uh, and deliberation goes forward. But I uh, wanted you, first of all, to know that uh, that, that occurred. Um, secondly, uh, we uh, have uh, had some Developments in uh, COVID-19. Um, we are uh, press, we are pressing hard for there to uh, be uh, some relaxing of the uh, phases, such that the frontline uh, per people in uh, our industry uh, can in fact get uh, vaccinated quicker. Um, I, 
I accepted an invitation to appear before our Senate, uh, excuse me, our House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Healthcare earlier uh, to make this pitch. And um, uh, unfortunately, we found out yesterday that teachers were not moved up. Therefore, uh, we have not been moved up as of yet, but we will continue to press on that. Um, today in the uh, South Carolina State Senate, uh, the Senate is uh, uh, voting on uh, liability protection legislation. Uh, we expect that to pass. And um, so uh, then we move to the House uh, and that would provide some immunity uh, that, uh, from litigation that would arise that is uh, COVID related. Um, uh, one bit of uh, news that's requiring an adjustment in safe dates is that we found out today that um, hospitality day as we know it, as a lunch on the lawn, uh, will not be permitted to be held as an event. Uh, we are exploring some options about some other things to do in conjunction with uh, putting the emphasis back on uh, hospitality and thanking the legislative delegations and the individual lawmakers for their support. Uh, but, um, but we haven't uh, put anything out on that as of yet. But uh, if you were planning to join us on April the 21st, uh, looks like it, uh, most of what we may be doing is communicating electronically. Uh, so uh, that's, um, that's something that uh, just developed today. Also, um, just got word from the governor's chief of staff that the governor is going to issue a news release tomorrow on something that was uh, char characterized as uh, a step that will be um, positive for our industry. Um, I would just say stay tuned on that. It's going to come out tomorrow morning. And um, so we always appreciate the fact that uh, positive steps are taken for us. Uh, so those are uh, breaking news items that occurred just today. Uh, uh, let me uh, turn your attention back to the slide that uh, has been there, but it just went away. There we go. Uh, to um, talk about uh, our legislative agenda items and how things are going. Uh, PRT's budget request, uh, they made a, a, a request of uh, House Ways and Means. Uh, that is always our lead item because it has such a significant impact across the state. And um, we will continue to work hard in that regard. Uh, workforce development, there are numerous programs that are being launched um, that are related not just to COVID-19, but also in anticipation of the fact that as the economy continues to recover uh, and the resilience uh, that we see out there um, indicates that uh, certainly it will continue to track in that direction, that um, uh, we're going to have a greater and greater need for a, a trained uh, workforce. So um, there are initiatives that are going on uh, there which uh, will help us in that regard. So we won't have a sort of gap between uh, workforce need and supply of uh, trained uh, people to fill those jobs. Uh, I already mentioned to you about the uh, business liability protection, uh, short-term rentals. Um, uh, they've been having a tough time of it. Um, numerous articles have come out. Uh, uh, our position always has been that we want it to be a level playing field. Many municipalities are cracking down on uh, the short-term rental industry. Uh, because of uh, violations of uh, th uh, things that are DHEC related and, uh, and other concerns. Um, we are making certain that uh, the short term rental industry does not grow disproportionately, nor does it have an opportunity to operate by, uh, and ignore uh, the same existing uh, regulations that govern the hotel industry. Human trafficking, we uh, named a member of the Attorney General's Task Force on Human Trafficking. Uh, in fact, they'll be meeting next week. And they're working very hard with them to raise awareness uh, and provide uh, training. Um, I'll skip down uh, to number seven. We always have an eye out for uh, legislation that would authorize earlier school starts. 
and uh, we, we uh, moved to defeat that. I would say that uh, the cornerstone of what we're going, we are pushing this year, and you know, we've already launched this, is to modernize the alcohol laws. Um, and that really has not been done for some time, uh, in even a piecemeal fashion. But I think we've laid the groundwork with the agencies that would be affected, and uh, they, at a minimum, are not going to uh, fight us on these. Um, first is uh, legalizing cocktails to go. There's uh, legislation in the hopper about that. Uh, Charleston, in particular, has been uh, pushing in that regard, and uh, we're optimistic that uh, that is going to pass. We've talked uh, with national associations to get a lot of data that uh, we've provided to members of the General Assembly. Statutory clarity on alcohol licenses uh, goes back to issue that uh, cropped up in the Five Points area of Columbia about two years ago on the question of what percentage of sale of food needs to be uh, made at an establishment in order for it to be issued an alcohol license. Um, one state senator, uh, Senator Donald Cluglia, has already filed some legislation uh, saying that needs to be 50 percent. Uh, but he said he is very flexible on it. I've had a direct conversation with him on that, and uh, he certainly is willing to compromise. Uh, and also, our chairman, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Bobby Williams, who uh, I know is listening uh, to this call and will speak in a few minutes, uh, has uh, spent a lot of time uh, on that issue. Uh, we are uh, are looking at a lot of different alternatives, including the insertion of. Uh, language that would uh, designate the establishment of taverns um, in our state and uh, then do the licensure for there. Uh, so uh, just know that uh, that is very much on our front burner, as is dram shop reform and uh, still alcohol licenses for caterers, which is a constitutional question, but we are doing uh, what we can to, uh, to uh, move that forward to ample accommodation. Remembering that the session is two years, and uh, so we are, are just getting cranked up. Um, with respect to this modernizing of alcohol laws, um, our chairman has uh, convened an ad hoc committee uh, to work on these areas uh, to not only uh, provide uh, substantive information, but also give us some guidance as to how best to mobilize grassroots efforts in order to uh, get legislation that uh, we are concerned about passed. And uh, so in conjunction with our lobbyist, McGuire Woods, we're moving forward on those items. Uh, so there's an awful lot that's uh, happening uh, at this juncture. And, uh, um, it, it, the advocacy that uh, we are doing on your behalf, uh, we respectfully submit is uh, seeing some results. Uh, back tomorrow morning, you'll see a result of it. And uh, uh, we want you to please not hesitate to let us know other areas, whether they're at the federal level, state level, or local level, with an ordinance problem or what have you that uh, you want some assistance with. We've gotten pretty deep into the weeds on uh, mask uh, concerns about face covering throughout the state and various interpretations of that. Um, and so uh, please uh, know that uh, we are in every sense of the word, your advocates. We are honored to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, respectfully submit that we are making a difference for you. And uh, so please let us hear from you. Um, Susan, that's uh, what I wanted to share. You're muted, Susan. Thank you, John. Sorry. Uh, again, thank you for that report. Um, again, if you have any questions for John about our legislative agenda, you can type those in the Q&A and we'll go over those uh, while Bobby gives us a message. Uh, Bobby Williams is our chairman of the board and I'm gonna turn it over to him. Hello, Susan. Hey, Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Am I live? You're live. How's everyone? Terrific program. I uh, I would like to thank our speakers. Number one, Brad and Clinton and Gene. Thank you for a terrific program. Uh, this came up to me this week: the ERTC tax credit. And of course, I brought it to my controller first thing, and the first thing he says is that we don't qualify. Which I can't wait to get on the phone with him and tell him we do qualify. 
And so my advice to everybody that's listening is I would apply for everything out there. Don't forget you're dealing with the federal government. Something's going to slip through the lines. And, and so something will, will uh, be granted to you. But I would apply for everything that's out there. Um, you got nothing to lose, to tell you the truth. Uh, John touched on um, modernizing our liquor laws. We've already started some fundraising on that. We will be getting with McGuire, Mo uh, McGuire Woods Consulting real soon to get that uh, ball really moving. Also, the COVID immunity legislation, uh, we partnered with the South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance, and of course, that's, that's moving in the right direction also. Only other thing, y'all have done such a good job, John, you've uh, stolen my thunder here. Um, there is the uh, Educational Foundation silent auction, March 9th through the 11th. Please, if you have anything to donate, um, some room nights would be nice. Restaurant, associate, uh, restaurant uh, gift certificates would be great, but that money goes straight to the Educational Foundation. And also, tentatively, the, uh, our Marketing and Operations Conference in Kiwa Island, which is scheduled for the 4th and the 5th. Hopefully, we can get that off. I see uh, John just told me that the Hospitality Day may be canceled or we'll have to reformat it. But uh, actually, that's really all I have. I thought it was a great presentation from everyone. And if you have any questions, um, please, you can ask them now. If not, I'll turn it back over to you, Susan. Uh, Susan, let me uh, interject. Uh, kudos and congratulations to Bobby. Uh, a national restaurant uh, publication picked the 100 plus most powerful and influential restaurateurs in the country. Uh, and they announced that uh, day before yesterday, and Bobby was among them. So, Bobby, congratulations. Bobby. Thank you. Yes. I'm building my resume at 68. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it was awesome. Thanks, everybody, for attending. I don't think I have any questions, but, you know, you can always email us with something if you think of it. Uh, again, this is being recorded, so it'll be up on our website. And um, that's a wrap. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Great job. Everybody take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.